Well, good morning. I had a stool up here I had to put away because you don't need me on that. I'd be really tall and I'd probably fall. Well, it's good to have you all with us this morning. Let's stand and sing Revive Us Again. If you want to use your hymnal, it's 434, Revive Us Again. Let's sing together.
Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful for this morning that you have given us. Lord, we're thankful for these hymns with the great truths that are in them. And Lord, we're thankful for this family that we have to gather together to grow in you. Lord, your word tells us that you want a, a purified church, a church that is without spot and blemish, unspotted from the world. And Lord, may we be that today and going forward. We pray these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. I'd say keep your hymnal out, but you don't need your hymnal on this one. We're just look up at the screen as we will be singing ancient words. bulletin. Let's go over the announcements. Rather quickly, Wednesday night services as scheduled. Vacation Bible School is coming up quickly. In, at the end of July, July 26th through 30th, we need you to save the date for that. We are still in need of some volunteers. So a Vacation Bible School can't happen without you. So we hope that you can uh, make time that week to come and minister to those children. I have updated the volunteer form. So out here by the by the VBS table, which is uh, it's a bay theme, and so there's uh, a seagull hanging from the ceiling and some crabs on the table. Don't worry, they won't pinch you, so you should be okay there. Uh, but stop by there and look at the, the volunteer form and see what's left, what still needs help. Uh, and we hope that you will consider that a vital ministry and also spread the word to all your friends and family. So let them know Vacation Bible School is coming soon. Tuesday night Bible study, just uh, two, two left, two left. So uh, Tuesday night, seven o'clock, that'll be a Zoom meeting. So look for the invitation there. Monday morning, ladies Bible study. I think we're in James chapter two. Not I say we, I'm not included in that, ladies. That is... Uh, James 2 for you ladies tomorrow morning. So join them for Ladies Bible Study for that. If you'd like to be a part of the special music ministry, we hope that you will let myself or Kelsey Wilson know, and we'll be sure to get you put on there. Now, the moment you've all been waiting for. Tonight, after the service, we are going to have a baked goods auction. 
And that's a live auction, not a silent auction, so it's going to be loud and chaotic because I'm going to be the auctioneer. And so we hope that you will join us for that. And uh, we have all the desserts and baked goods lined out. That's the one thing people have, have said, I'm going to bring something for it. We already have it all lined out. It's all going to be here. We just want you to come and bid on some wonderful things. We're also going to have some door prizes, some great prizes for you. So all you have to do is come for those. And so we hope that you will join us tonight for that auction. Also, volleyball. You guys missed volleyball, right, all winter long? We should have played it all winter long out there in the freezing cold. No, uh, volleyball is coming up in just a few weeks, May 16th, following the evening services each week, and um, we hope that you will join us for that. It's a great time of fellowship. And the Rachel House bottle, baby bottle drive ends today. So does that mean you can no longer give to Rachel House? Of course not. That's just our... Our fundraiser of the Baby Bottle Drive, it's out there. We hope that um, if you're coming back tonight or if you never grabbed a bottle, it's not too late. Do that. You can even write a check and stick it in the bottle if you want to. Uh, so um, anyway, bring those baby bottles back. If you're coming tonight and forgot it, that's okay. Bring it back tonight or as soon as you can get it to us so we can get those over to Rachel House. Uh, next week, Donut Sunday. Oh, that was sad, guys. Next week, Donut Sunday. And then uh, next week during the service, you'll all be in that sugar coma and after eating all them donuts. So anyway, plan to join us for that. We'll also observe the Lord's Supper next Sunday morning, so join us. And uh, elders and deacons will have a meeting next uh, Sunday at 5 o'clock, so join us for that. We also have the fundraising continuing. Uh, you'll see how well we're doing in the Sound Improvement Fund on the back of the bulletin. And it has just come a long way, and praise the Lord for that. He is, he is paving the way for us to get that new uh, system for us. It's going to be better for those that are at home as well as for those that are in attendance here. Uh, no longer this mess up here with the screen on the wall. Well, I mean the wall as a screen. We'll have a screen. <laughs> and so it'll be, uh, it'll be a blessing to see. And then come tonight and, and help us um, raise the funds for that. We did find out this week that from the time they gave us the bid till now that the, the market has gone up some, and that's understandable, but uh, we are still doing well. We're doing well, and so we're really excited about it. And the Israel trip, if you'd like to donate to that for Jim and Carol, is also on there. Now, we had a guest speaker this morning during the, uh, during the Sunday school hour, Nathan and uh, Christy Robbins, and so we are glad to have them with us this morning. And they're gonna, he's going to come up, or maybe both of them are coming up, I don't know. They're going to come up, and they're going to share just a little bit about their ministry, just a, a brief, if you weren't there in Sunday school, this is to help you see what they are getting ready to do. And uh, we are familiar with Nathan. He's part of the, part of, uh, the Appalachian Bible College family, and so um, the Caltons know him, and the Wilsons know him, and they were in the, he was in the Wilsons' wedding, and so forth, roommates with Andy, uh, all that stuff. So anyway, here's Nathan. Well, good morning. It is great to be with you here today. Many of you are unfamiliar faces. There are a few very familiar faces throughout the congregation this morning, and it is so good to be back. We greatly enjoyed last night reconnecting with some close friends and being able to see how God has been working in their lives and ministries and families. And it truly is a blessing to be able to look back over a period of years and just see God's faithfulness, to see how he has been blessing and how he has grown individuals to be more like him. My name is Nathan, and along with my wife, Christy, and three kids, we are here today to share more about the ministry that God has called us to. We are missionary church planters headed to the city of Buffalo, New York. We're serving with Continental Baptist Missions, and we are excited to hopefully arrive next year to begin the work of planting a church in the neighborhood of Five Points. It was a, a couple-year process of God working in our own hearts. I was serving as the pastor of Sutter Salem Bible Church in West Central Illinois, and as he began to really grow a burden for discipleship, for evangelism, he showed us the need for church planting in North America. 
Throughout those couple of years, we really began to lead and direct that ministry to be involved in the work of church planting. And ultimately, God used that in my life, in my family's life, to lead us from West Central Illinois to head to Buffalo, New York. So we have been on deputation for right at a year. We literally began five weeks before COVID-19 hit. So it has been uh, an interesting year. But I can say this, God has used this year to grow my wife and I in so many ways. He's grown us in our dependence upon him. He's grown just that this is the affirmation that this is where God has us. As we've seen partners join us in churches and individuals, We are about halfway there. We're at 40% of the needed support, and we've been putting together a team. We have one other couple that's going to be joining us, and we're praying about some others. So we are moving along towards that goal. If you do not know the city of Buffalo, the city of Buffalo is a Rust Belt city. It's located right off of the Erie Canal, and at the turn of the last century, it was one of the wealthiest and largest cities in North America. It was an industry powerhouse, an early developer of electricity, the steel industry, and even agriculture as it moved grain along the Erie Canal. But over the last 70 years, as the economy really crashed in that city, there's been a lot of hopelessness. A lot of people have left the city, have left the region, and along with the people leaving, many churches have closed, many Churches have left. And over the last 20 years specifically, we've seen that area turn their back on religion and God. Almost 40% of the population there claims no belief in God whatsoever. No religious affiliation. Thousands of young people are growing up without even knowing what the Bible is or having heard the name of Jesus. We are excited to move into the city, to be able to share the hope of the gospel, to be able to show the love of Christ to a people that truly are lost and dying. We're doing this on our own, yes, but through partnership with local churches. Our sending church is Faith Baptist Church in Camp Point, Illinois, and we have also partnered with eight other churches at this time, both in the Midwest and three churches out in Buffalo, New York, or out in that region. So we invite you to talk to us today, to look at our table. If you have any other questions, we would love to share more about what that ministry is going to look like, or maybe any other details or questions that you have. Please look myself up, my wife. We would love to meet you, to talk more. We also invite you to sign up for our newsletter to be one of our prayer partners, just an opportunity to together lift up the need and the people of Western New York. So thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. Thank you, Nathan. And uh, we are collecting a love offering for both Nathan and Christy Robbins and and their expenses and and traveling here and being here and uh, just to to show that our, our love and support for them. So if you'd like to give to that love offering, that's on the app as well as our website, and you can also do it um, at the at the giving station outside if you'd like to do that. All right, birthday. Any announcements I missed? All right, birthdays. Kristen Dotson, Ray Patton, Roger Pickard, Randy Wheats. It's just Kristen. Come on down, Kristen. That's what I meant. It's Kristen, ladies and gentlemen. That's right. This will be our final hymn this morning. If you would stand with me as we sing, praise him, praise him. If you would like to use the hymnal, it's hymn 12. Praise him, praise him. Stand with me as we sing.
my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art. chapter we get to celebrate once a year. And before we get to John 16, while you're turning there, just a few things. Uh, number one, just praise the Lord for the provision for uh, the sound fund. We're not completely there yet, but it's pretty close. Uh, I encourage you to come and take part in the auction tonight, whether you buy something or not. I think it's going to be fun just to be together. You know, it's been a long, it's been kind of a dearth of fellowship. Uh, for the last year, and uh, it's going to be good to get back into the swing of things as uh, hopefully more and more uh, the COVID restrictions relax and we can uh, we can get back into those things. Looking forward to, to volleyball. I, somebody's already asked me, do you play volleyball? That was a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Uh, no, I will come and watch, um, but I will not play, right? Yeah, my wife won't let me play. That's what it really comes down to. I'm going to live vicariously through my son now. He can play. Uh, but as far as the, the auction tonight, we've got, uh, you know, we've said we've got some great bakers in our church. I was trying to decide whether I'm a good advertisement for that or a bad advertisement for that this morning. I'm a good advertisement because I've obviously eaten a lot of it. A bad advertisement because this is what happens when you eat a lot of it. So uh, exercise self-control, but come out and buy some pies or some cakes or breads or what have you and join us for that tonight and I want to uh, thank the Robins for being here today and uh, he just had a wonderful presentation in Sunday school and uh, I'm going to borrow something off your one of your slides this morning as a matter of fact uh, in the future uh, just to be totally transparent Caleb and Emily and my wife and I have been getting together for the last couple months and talking about some things for the future and uh, I thought one of your, your slides this morning really encapsulated that well. So, uh, it, you know, when, when it's ministerially speaking, it's not stealing it. I'm going to borrow it, right? Is that right, brother, right? Uh, so you'll be seeing that later on. And uh, we're, we're hoping to bring some, uh, some, some things uh, to the board and bring some things to the church uh, as we look forward to uh, a post-COVID world and post-COVID ministry. And I know some of you are nervous and say, oh, no, they're going to change things. There's one thing that's never going to change here, is at least as long as I'm pastor, and I think I could speak for Caleb as well, is the focus is always going to be the Word of God. The focus is always going to be on the gospel of Jesus Christ, on sound doctrine, expository preaching, but it's got to be on reaching out and reaching to people as well, whether it be as a church or whether it be uh, as individual believers. Our hope is to equip you and continue to equip you to reach out wherever you're at in the workplace, in your neighborhood, in your family, uh, and, and start inviting people to church again as people get a better comfort level uh, with being out and about. We are in John chapter 6, but we're going to talk more about those things as we go forward, not this morning. We're in John chapter 16 this morning. I won't promise they won't creep into today because there are a lot of those things are on our minds and hearts. I'm speaking as uh, myself and my wife, Caleb and Emily. Uh, and we're, we want to start having that conversation now and start, start talking about those things and how what Jesus is talking about here in John chapter 16 is really smack dab in the middle of that. Jesus has been talking about those three relationships uh, that we saw in John chapter 15. He talked about that relationship that we have as Christians to Christ and what an intimate relationship that is how important it is to abide. He used that word ten times, to abide in Him and in His love. 
And that's going to equip us with joy and it's going to equip us with the ability to come to the Father with the request according to His will with the confidence that He's going to answer those requests. We also talked about our relationships with fellow believers and how vital that is. And then we talked about the relationship that we're to have as Christians with the world. And He's going to continue that just a little bit in chapter 16, but He's going to move on to one of the most vital relationships that we're to have that is all too often misunderstood and neglected, and that is our relationship with the Holy Spirit. And it shouldn't be misunderstood because there's ample information about it in God's Word, but it also shouldn't be misunderstood because if you know Christ as your Savior today, you have the Holy Spirit within you. It's non-optional. If you come to a genuine relationship with Christ, he gives you the Holy Spirit. We talked last week about the fact that it's not one of those things that you have to go out and seek after you come to faith in Christ. don't have to prove it by speaking in tongues or doing other initiations or things like that. When you come to know Christ as your Savior, when you come to faith in Him, you get the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is vital to our Christian life. And we're going to be looking at that probably... The Probably the next couple weeks. I, I want to say this week, but you know me. All right. Let's read and we'll pray. These things I have spoken to you. Verse 1, chapter 16, Gospel of John. These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them and these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we open your word this morning that we would also open our hearts. That Father, we would be uh, ready to be taught by your Holy Spirit. That we would have eyes that see the things that you call upon us to see and ears that are ready to hear the things that you call upon us to hear. And Father, that we would have a genuine understanding of what it means to have the Holy Spirit of God within us as believers and the need for those that don't know Christ today uh, that they have to come to that faith relationship in Christ and to have the Holy Spirit within them. Father, we pray that you bless the hour pray that you would bless uh, the day before us in Christ's name. Amen. Well, part of what Jesus is doing here is he moves on to this next relationship, this relationship with the Holy Spirit is to forewarn the apostles and us as well. And one of the things I like to uh, continue to remind you as we go through these last hours in the life of Christ is sometimes we get this idea that Jesus is only speaking to these 11 men. Remember, Judas has already gone his way to do the things that Satan has put in his heart and he has yielded to. So it's these 11 men that Jesus is having this intense time of teaching and fellowship before he goes to the cross. And we kind of look at this, and, and well, he's talking to them, so that was for them, and it's not for us. What's for us? This is for us. This is as much for us as it is for them. And if we don't understand that as a church and as believers, then we, are, we run the risk of not being forewarned. Now, there's an old saying that says, uh, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. And that, in part, is what Jesus is doing. We've been, uh, the last couple weekends, we had the opportunity to go down to Bennett Springs, and uh, I grew up fly fishing. And I really enjoy fly fishing. I, I really forgot how much I'd missed it. We hadn't been there in six or seven years. And my son's just starting out in, in, with fly fishing. How many of you have ever fly fished before? It's Now, for those of you who say, what is that? It's not catching flies. I've had, I've had somebody, well, why would you catch flies? Yeah. No, it's not catching flies. It's not fishing for flies. You, using the little artificial lures that are called flies. Uh, to to catch trout or other fish. We, we're trout fishing down at Bennett Springs. And, uh, you know, when you first start out and, and teaching him, last weekend is the first weekend he went. He's a, he's kind of a natural. He outfished me yesterday. 
Uh, I'll, I'll admit that. Um, I may have got the bigger fish, but we didn't didn't compare. I uh, conveniently I went and cleaned my real fish. And I, yeah, mine was bigger. Um, but as you go through the process of learning to fly fish on a stream, especially, and if it's a if it's a state park like this, you have a lot of people down there. You have to be kind of forewarned. You have to understand what's going on. And so we're doing a lot of the training now and understanding, make sure you know who's behind you because if you've ever seen people fly fish, they'll whip that line behind them and sling it back out in the stream and whip it back again. And on the end of that line, people tend to forget there's a little hook. Now, my uncle's here today. He's He was down there this weekend as well and grew up fly fishing with him, with Pastor Roger, with my dad, many other people. And I think he remembers this story. I think he was involved in this story. Uh, a fellow was down there, and I don't know if he was new to it or just the wind or whatever, but he flicked that line out, and he flicked it back, and right there, that fly just took hold right in the middle of his forehead. And was it you he turned to, Zach? Yeah, it was. And the guy, Zach, tells the story. The guy turns and goes, oh. He's got this hook dangling from the middle of his forehead. They say, well, what's the point of that story in relation to the gospel? We need to be forewarned with what we're dealing with and the situation we're dealing with and how it works. Zach had to go over and pluck that out of his head. Now, imagine being not only the person that has the fly in the middle of the head, but being the one that's asked to pluck it out of the middle of the head. Christ said, look, some things are going to happen as you go forward. And it's not a rosy scenario. We, we like to have rosy pictures painted for us. If you've ever gone to a, a presentation, we went to a presentation a few years ago in Branson because it was just you know too good to pass up. They will give you tickets to this, give you a visa card for that, and all you have to do is go to a 90-minute presentation on a timeshare. Now, I'm going to tell you what, you want to find some people that know how to paint a rosy picture. I'm not saying go to a timeshare presentation, but they know how to give you the best possible scenario. My wife and I, we said we're going to do this so we can get all these freebies. But the day before we prayed and fasted so that we wouldn't get sucked into it. You know, we were determined we're going to go, we're going to get the freebies and then we're out. And so every time, are you interested? No, we're not interested. God give us strength. We're not interested. They they paint the rosiest scenario. Politicians every two and four years paint the rosiest scenarios of what's going to happen if you let me into office. Look at what Jesus does. He's already told us what the benefits are, but he says, look, there are also some harsh realities because of the spiritual climate, which, by the way, in Jesus' day has not changed. To today it's the same spiritual climate jesus says look here's what's going to happen these things i've spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble again so you can be forewarned here's what the response in some cases is going to be they will put you out of the synagogues yes the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers god service wow what an enticement to stand on the gospel and sound doctrine. The time is coming when they're going to put you out of the synagogue and they may kill you. Paul said something similar to Timothy. He said, look, Timothy, all who, live, all who desire to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. Persecution is part of the Christian life. As Americans, we don't appreciate that enough. I fear the time is upon us and will increasingly be so when we're going to see more and more persecution. But at the same time, I understand that God says to us in his word that Christ himself said that if we're going to live for Christ, if we're going to preach the gospel, if we're going to stand on sound doctrine, we're going to be persecuted and persecution is part of God's plan. And in fact, it is often a necessary element that we don't have that helps to spur both revival 
and growth in the church and brings people to Christ. You see, that's count, we use a big word, that's counterintuitive. You know what? A lot of what God tells us in His Word to our mind is counterintuitive. But it's exactly what God calls us to step out on in faith. Jesus said to him, look, you're going to be put out of the synagogue. Now, that doesn't mean anything to us. Anybody here ever belong to a synagogue? I didn't think so. Synagogue is, is strictly a Jewish institution. It started really in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it became the local church, if you will, of the Jewish faith. If you go into a town, especially as the Jews spread out from not just in Israel, but because of the dispersion we've been talking about in the gospel, or in the gospel of Daniel, in the book of Daniel, about that Babylonian captivity, and years before that, the Assyrian captivity, a lot of the Jews were spread over the then known world, and it was impractical and impossible to come back to the temple every year, even though they were commanded to do so. So what did they do? They set up synagogues. And the synagogue, again, kind of became the local church of the Jewish faith, and they went there to be instructed in God's word, and it's amazing how God used the synagogue system years later actually to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul went first in the early days of the book of Acts to the Jews first, then also the Greeks. He went to the synagogue first, as you read through the, the book of Acts, and find that he's preaching the gospel there. Why? Because they knew the scripture, and it was the scripture that pointed to Jesus Christ. So, the synagogue was a place of worship, if you will. It was a place of instruction, but it was more than that. There's more to being put out of the synagogue and the uh, ramifications of that than just not being able to go and hear the word of God set forth. Because in reality, you can hear the word of God set forth anywhere. It doesn't have to be in a church. It doesn't have to be in the synagogue in their day. The synagogue had become a euphemism for being put out of the Jewish family, out of the faith. Now, we've already seen this in the Gospel of John back in chapter 8, where the man who was born blind was healed, and his parents were called in to basically confirm, was he really blind, or, or you know, is he putting this on, or what have you? And they didn't want to answer it. They didn't want to get involved. And John tells us the reason that they didn't want to get involved was because they feared they'd be put out of the synagogue. Now, what, why that was such a big deal is because the synagogue had become kind of the social support network for the Jews, especially outside of Jerusalem. We have social security in the United States, and for lack of a better comparison, the synagogue, to be part of the synagogue, to be part of that local Jewish community was a lot like having social security. When you got to the place where you were a widow or a widower, or you couldn't work or you were infirmed, you could go to the synagogue and have some confidence that your fellow Jews in that community were going to take care of you. There, was going to, there were perks, if you will, to be a part of the synagogue. And so Jesus is warning them and future generations of Jewish believers that there's going to come a time that for your faith, you're going to be shunned. You're going to be cut off. You're not going to be part of that support system anymore. You're going to stand alone, but really you're going to stand with Christ. And folks, when we're standing with Christ, we're never standing alone. At the end of Paul's life in 2 Timothy, he writes that everybody had deserted him. Everybody had gone their own way. But Christ stood with him. And it's no different for us today. Paul or Christ says here, look, they're gonna they're gonna put you out of the synagogue. Big deal to this group of Jewish men and to the early church. But he says, then it's gonna get not better, but it's gonna get worse. He's gonna he says some of them are even gonna say it's going to be doing God's service if we kill these Christians. And lo and behold, we have this example in the book of Acts. This young man that stood by as Stephen was being stoned for his testimony concerning Jesus Christ, and his name was Saul. And Saul tells us later as he gives us kind of his biography and he gives us uh, what, what brought him to Christ is that he was zealous 
for God, and part of his zeal for God, he believed at the time, was to go out and persecute the church. Not just give them a hard time, but literally, as we're told in the book of Acts, to give consent to the death of Christians because of their faith. Exactly what Jesus has said here in John 16 unfolds before us in the book of Acts. Now, in the early days of the church, there wasn't initially a lot of persecution. As a matter of fact, the day of Pentecost, you have 3,000 souls added to the church. 3,000 people come to Christ. And as we go on in the book of Acts and we read for the first few chapters, there were people added daily to the church because they got together every day. And where did they get together? They got together in the temple area, the same place that Jesus taught before the crucifixion. And people were coming to Christ. And by and large, these people were Jewish people who were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And the more people came, the more the church grew. And the more the church grew, the more they had opportunity to minister. And by the way, the more they had opportunity to minister, the more apparent it became some of the issues and problems that they were going to have. And, and we won't get into all that, but Acts chapter 7, there were issues about feeding certain people and dealing with needs, and they initiate uh, the deacons, and they put deacons in place to serve, and they put people in place to serve and take care of those needs. And it was the glory days of the early church. I think it would have been easy for these 11 men to look back on what Jesus said here in John 16 and say, you know, Jesus said there was going to be persecution. Jesus said that they were going to kill us. They were going to put us out of this. But, but this is great. People are coming to faith in Christ, and we got a good reputation. It tells us in the book of Acts, the church had a good reputation with the whole community, and then all of a sudden, persecution started. A couple of years go by, a few years go by, and persecution starts, and it ramps up. And I have no doubt that they looked back on these hours before Jesus goes to the cross and said, Jesus was right again. Persecution is coming. They're even threatening our lives. Christians are being put to death. Reality set in. Now, again, we look at it and say, wow, that's not a very, that's not a very positive message. That's not going to bring people to Christ. But Jesus doesn't give us positive messaging. Jesus doesn't fall into the trap that all too often the 21st century church falls into, and that is we have to market the church better in order to get a better response, or we have to kind of trick people to come to church so that we can kind of sneak the gospel in there. I appreciated what, uh, what you said this morning about being just open about the gospel message. It's not about tricking people into the gospel. It's about being real. It's about dealing with real spiritual realities. And part of those real spiritual realities are that people apart from Jesus Christ are without hope. Not only in this life, but certainly in eternity. And so Christ doesn't call us to marketing. He doesn't call us to trickery. He calls us to preach the word, in season, out of season. He calls us to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. He calls us to be compassionate, certainly. He calls us to, as much as it depends on us, to do good to all men and to live peace and live at peace with all men. But to never compromise the message of the gospel. It's always the message of the gospel and sound doctrine that is going to provoke a response from the people who are being preached to or witnessed to or taught. And there's only two responses. God's word is clear that there's two responses. We either receive it or we reject it. We've seen this throughout the Gospel of John. Christ has been very clear about it. When we hear the Gospel message or we hear sound doctrine, we either receive it or we reject it. You say, well, what about in between? I can just think about it. You know, every time we say, oh, I'm just going to think about it, then we're over here on the rejection side. 
because we've decided it's not important enough to deal with right now. Christ calls us to deal with what he brings to us through his word and what the Holy Spirit brings to us right now. He says, here's, here's the information I'm giving you. There, verse 3 says, these things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. They're going to persecute. They even kill. Why? Because they've never known the Father. They're at odds with the gospel. Again, whenever we reject what God's word says, we find ourselves at odds with what God calls us to do. And we run the risk as unbelievers of never coming to faith in Christ. And as believers, we run the risk of being out of the will of God. He goes on, verse 4. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember what I told you again. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. This hasn't changed today. We still have the uh, we still have the same information. We have the responsibility to look about and know what the signs of the times are and not back away from sound doctrine and not back away from the, the gospel message but to be resolved that we're going to stay true to the message that God has given us to do and understand when we do preach that message and when we do live the gospel in our lives and when we do live God's word in our lives, that it's going to possibly bring persecution to us. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with, you know, Jesus is prepping them to come back to the point that he's already started, and that's to talk about the Holy Spirit. He said, you know, I didn't tell you these things at the beginning because I was right here with you. Last week we talked about the fact that when Jesus was with them, he really bore the brunt of everything that he's talking about right here. And in fact, he bore the ultimate brunt just a few hours later. The persecution was directed at Jesus. To use a military term, he was drawing the fire. They were behind him. He's got their back. He's taking care of him. He's drawing the fire on himself. The persecution is aimed at him. The ultimate persecution going to the cross at the hands of those who thought they were doing the service of God was right before him. So he says, while I was with you and while I continue to be with you, it's not here, but that's the implication, then there was no need for you to know these things. But now the hour has come. There's going to be a change in situation, a change in dynamics, and they need to be prepared. They need to be forewarned so that they can be forearmed. Verse 5, he says, but now I go away to him who sent me. The him is the father. He's been talking about this throughout this upper room discourse that he's about to leave. He's about to depart and go to be with the father. He says, but now I go to him who sent me. And if you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you. Sorrow has filled your heart. Now, this is a back and forth we've been dealing with during this upper room discourse. None of them really has the nerve or the courage to say to Jesus, where are you going? And none of them have had the spiritual acumen to deduce. He's already told them. Remember what we looked at in John chapter 14. I go to prepare a place for you. That's where he's going. And since I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So he says, none of you have asked me where you're going, but sorrows filled your heart. This is an important little dynamic here, because the disciples have heard everything that he said, and instead of connecting the dots, and part of the reason they can't connect the dots is because of what we're going to talk about concerning the Holy Spirit, they've allowed sorrow to overtake them. That's the first thing Jesus said in John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For us today, the application is this. We can connect the dots. If you know Christ today, you have the same ability that I have to connect the dots. It's the Holy Spirit. The only difference between you and me is the calling God has placed on our life. God is called me to be up here. Why? I cannot tell you. 
there are mysteries in the universe, and this is one of them. But the capacity we have to understand this book is the same. He said, well, you went to Bible college. I tell you what, I enjoyed Bible college. You know, back in the little house on the prairie days compared to these guys that are up here this morning. We had one Bible. We shared it around the college. And we had our meals out by the campfire and big kettle of beans and corn dodgers. You guys know what corn dodgers are? If not, you never watch True Grit. I'm going to tell you what, Bible college is great. I'm not defaming Bible college, but you know what you, you, know what you spend the next 10 years doing? You, t you spend the next 10 years unlearning a lot of what you learned in Bible college and learning it in the school of reality. And the school of reality is what God takes not just pastors and missionaries through. Really, the school of spiritual realities is what God takes every single believer through if we're willing to go through it. And that is in part what Jesus is prepping them for. The school of spiritual realities is that there will be persecution, that there will be the threat of death, that there will be problems, that there will be sorrow, but God has given us something, and I would say more specifically in the context here, Christ has given us something that enables us to deal with the persecution that enables us to deal with the threat of death, to deal with the sorrow, and to deal with every single thing that we encounter in our walk as believers. And that something is really not a something, it's a someone, the Holy Spirit. God gives us the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, I'm sorry, verse 5, nope, verse 6, nope, verse 7. I could do the auction tonight. Verse 6, 7, 7, 8, 8, 9, 9, 10. Oh, dear. Verse 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. Now, can you imagine sitting there as one of the disciples, and Jesus has been telling him repeatedly, mind you, I'm going away, I'm going away, I'm going away. They're going to kill me, I'm going away. But I will come again and receive the end of myself, but I'm going away. And sorrows filled their heart. And when sorrow fills our heart, what we want to hear emotionally is something that is going to perk us back up. And Jesus says, nevertheless, I tell you, it is to your advantage that I, and I think they're going to hope and he'll say that I stick around, that I stay. But he says, it's to your advantage that I go away. You see how? Scripture so often times and God's will and God's working in our life is counterintuitive. It's not what we expect. We envision it going this way and God takes us this way. We talked about Moses a few weeks ago and Daniel uh, a few weeks ago in our Daniel study on Sunday nights. And both of those men were called into or back into service when they were 80 years old. Now imagine being called back into service when you're 80 years old or for the first time. I can't imagine it. Those of you that are 80, I'm sure you can't imagine it. You know what? God may call you tomorrow into service. I can guarantee God has called you into service, whether you're 8 or 80 this morning. And that is to be in the service of the gospel, to share the gospel with others, to declare it to those God has put in your sphere of influence. Jesus says, look, it's to your advantage that I go. Because if he didn't go, the next thing couldn't happen. Let's see what he says. He says, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, verse 7, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And we've already, he's already identified the helper. The helper is the Holy Spirit. The Helper is the Spirit of God. And let's remind again from last week, the Spirit of God is no less God than God the Father or God the Son. They are co-equal. They are the triune Godhead. There's not one capacity, one attribute that one has that the others don't share. 
Now think of the significance of that. If you know Christ is your Savior this morning, as we looked at last week, the moment you came to faith in Christ, you received the Holy Spirit. He's in you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 through 20, we looked at last week. You can revisit it again. How Paul emphasizes the fact that we have that Spirit within us. That we have that Spirit from God. We become, because we have the Spirit in us, living, breathing, walking, talking, temples of the Holy Spirit. Everywhere we go, not just on church on Sunday, but wherever you go for the rest of the day, whatever you do tomorrow, whether it's to go physically to work or you're working online, you're still a temple of the Holy Spirit as a believer this morning. There's never a time when you don't have the Holy Spirit. Now, God's Word tells us that we also need to desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 4, it makes it clear that we, or chapter 5, that we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we make it so mysterious as to how that's supposed to happen. Well, how do I get filled with the Holy Spirit? Do I go by the Holy Spirit? Do I go, do I have to go do something to get the Holy Spirit? God makes it amazingly simple for us to understand our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Again, He's already put His Holy Spirit in us. As we talked about last week, He sealed us with His Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. In order to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we have to simply yield to the Holy Spirit. Let's take a look at the Gospel. I've got the Gospel on the brain this morning. Galatians. Let's go to the book of Galatians for just a few moments. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Galatians 5, 16, Paul says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. What an amazingly simple statement. And the tragedy, if you know Christ today, is this, passage has kind of been relegated to this is the way you avoid temptation and you avoid sin. Walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. We put the emphasis on the last part instead of the first part. And we kind of have an end result in mind. Well, I want to guard from temptation, I don't want, so I'm going to walk in the Spirit. God puts it the other way around. The emphasis is on the first part, not on the last part. Walk in the Spirit. One of the results is that we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Why will we not fulfill the lust of the flesh? Because the Spirit of God is never going to lead us to a place where we would even be tempted to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Not just physical places, but places in our thoughts. Places that we take our eyes to, or we take our mind to, we take our ears to. When we walk in the Spirit, we're not going to fulfill the lusts of the flesh because we're going to be occupied with the Spirit. Well, what does it mean to be walking in walk the Spirit? I, I, I love this chapter. And I love the emphasis in Scripture on our relationship with the Spirit. But again, I say it's, it's a mystery to a lot of Christians. I had somebody come up a couple of years ago and say, you keep saying walk in the Spirit. I don't know what that means. That's understandable. We're woefully educated in God's Word as Christians all too often. You know what it means to walk in the Spirit? It means, again, to yield to the Holy Spirit and go wherever the Spirit leads us. I think the appropriate picture that we've seen in the Gospel of John was to connect that good shepherd ministry, that great shepherd ministry of Jesus back to the 23rd Psalm. Wherever the shepherd leads us, we're going to follow right behind because we hear his voice and we respond to his voice. The Holy Spirit's the same way. As Christians, we're to respond to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's over there, and we should be over there. We should be with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm, I'm sorry, son, I'm going to use you again. My poor kids, your poor kids, as they get older, you know, that, that fertile ground. You are, you are using your kids as an example. It's natural. And, and I know my kids will come and say, well, people were saying, are you all right? Your dad told that story about you today. <laughs> Imagine living with me. My kids are toughened up. So. Uh, 
CJ's a better student than I was. And when I was, when my dad and Roger and other people were teaching me to fly fish, I did. You got you old folks do it your way. I'm going to do it my way. And they'd say, stand here, cast out there, keep your line up above. Just really simple, you know, move around a little bit, check different places, try different flies, all that stuff. You don't know what you're talking about. I read a book. I read a book. I could tell you how to fly fish better than you know how to fly fish. Not so. And so I'd do it my own way. And I'd be way down the stream. And they'd be way up the stream. And I'd look you back every once in a while. I'm not catching any fish. But I know how to do it. I'm an expert. You know, I read a book. Uh, and, and I'm not catching. I'd look and they'd all have fish on their line. And so you would think that would make me go back up there. Nope, I just keep moving down the street. We do the same thing with the Holy Spirit. If we want to walk in the Spirit, then we've got to put away our own preconceived ideas of what it means to be a Christian. Frankly, we've got to put away a lot of the stuff that we've learned and we've heard. We have to unlearn a lot of things. We have to go back to that book as our standard. Again, not to say there aren't good books. I always get somebody, well, you, you say don't read any other book. Now, I'm not saying that, but that should be our best book. Spurgeon said, visit many good books, but live in the Scripture. Because that's the gold standard. And it's always going to direct us, not downstream, it's going to direct us right by the Holy Spirit. You know where I learned the most? Was standing right next to my, my dad. Standing right next to Pastor Roger. Standing right next to people who knew what they were doing because they'd been doing it for a lot of years. It's the same with the Holy Spirit. You want to walk in the Spirit? It just means stick close to the Holy Spirit. Walk in the ways that He leads us in. We're going to talk more about the Holy Spirit as we go on next week. But for today, the Holy Spirit calls upon every person in this room, every single person, myself included. And again, we have two responses we can give. We can either receive and respond, or we can reject it. If you've never come to faith in Jesus Christ this morning, the Holy Spirit's call to you is to come to faith in Christ. God's Word tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of that sin is death, eternal separation from God. But, glorious little word, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. John 3.16, we saw much earlier in this study, for God so loved the world, make it personal, God so loved you, God so loved me, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Holy Spirit of God, every time we hear the gospel, if you've never come to faith in Christ, confronts your heart with the opportunity to either receive it or reject it. If you say, I'm going to think about it, then you reject it. God's Word tells us that we don't know how much time we have on this world. And I don't say that as a scare tactic. It's just a harsh reality. And if you leave this world without knowing Christ as your Savior, without coming to that faith relationship in Him, then there's no more time to think about it. It's eternity apart from God. So you have the opportunity to receive it and respond to the Holy Spirit or reject it. Believers, you and I have the same responsibility and opportunity today. We, we, we love to hear the gospel preached and we tell them, get them, get them. Yeah, tell them they're receiving or they're rejecting. You know what? Every Christian, we are also confronted with the word of God and we either receive it or reject it. It's only, there's a key difference. If we reject it, it doesn't result in eternal separation from God. But you know what it can result in? It can result in broken fellowship. It can result in a lot of wasted time. And I speak from a lot of experience. Because just as surely as my dad was upstream and I was downstream, 
very often in my life was God upstream and I was downstream. And the Holy Spirit was saying, hey, the fish are up here. Come up here. Come back up here. Nope. I got it. I'll stay down here. I'll do it on my own. I've got a whole new system. No more books. I'm writing the book. You know what? If we are determined to do it on our own, all too often God lets us do it on our own. He's very gracious. But he's always desirous that we come back upstream and that we walk with the Spirit. Because when we walk with the Spirit, we stick by the Spirit, then we're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. We go to the end of that chapter. And another happy result of yielding to the Holy Spirit is we're going to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. Those things are going to be part of who we are and what we represent to others. If you're a believer today, you can receive what the Holy Spirit calls upon you to do. Maybe that's making changes in your priorities. Maybe that's to determine to be a witness to the people God has put in your life. Maybe that's to heal relationships that are broken. I don't know what it is. That's part of the work of the Holy Spirit. He deals with every individual person in here. Some of you he's dealing with concerning salvation. Some of you he's dealing with some very personal, spiritual issues in your life. And again, not to leave myself out because I don't have it together. He deals with me all the time. We can either receive it and respond or we can reject it. And hope for the best. God's word is always, won't you listen? Won't you listen and respond? This morning, if you've never come to faith in Christ, we invite you to come. We'll show you from God's word how you can do that. Know today that you have eternal life in Jesus Christ and begin your walk with him. Christians, there's a lot here. Persecution, to some degree or another, is always part of the Christian life. We need to be prepared to be forewarned is to be forearmed. And we need to be yielded to the Holy Spirit that God has given us. We're going to talk more about the Holy Spirit in the weeks to come. But everything you have right now is enough to start as a believer yielding to and walking in the Spirit today. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless the remainder of this day. And Father, the things that we've looked at this morning and the things that we've uh, seen in your word, Father, that you would use them to get our heart's attention. Father, I think most importantly this morning, if there's one that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, that today would be the day that they come to know him and know that their sins are forgiven, know that they have an eternity with you and that they have the resources to continue on in this life with the joy and the peace that you promised and the opportunity to be a witness for you. And Father, for those who know Christ, that today we would look at our priorities and put aside our priorities and allow them to be replaced with the Spirit's priorities in our life. Father, we pray you bless this time of invitation and the remainder of the day in Christ's name. Amen. Two verses of a hymn of invitation this morning. If you've got a decision you'd like to make, make it where you stand or make it public. Come up and pray if you'd like. But don't reject what the Spirit has brought to your heart today. Let's stand up. Let's stand and sing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. <laughs> Oh,
right. Well, we hope you enjoy the, the beautiful weather today, and uh, we hope that you will join us back here tonight at 6 o'clock. Uh, Nathan's going to be bringing the message for us tonight, and then we'll have our uh, baked auction, baked good auction, following the evening service. We hope that you'll join us for that. Let's be dismissed in prayer. Don Reynolds, would you close us this morning?